by Chopin. Um, and whenever I do this, it brings up a lot of emotions, a lot of memories, because I've been playing Chopin since I was a small child. And I've had some of my most powerful musical experiences uh, connected with the works of Chopin. Although I've played many, many genres and many composers, uh, I find as I get older, the music of Chopin just appeals to me more. And one of the benefits of being a president is you can play whatever you want. <laughs> you know, so I, I have a lot of I have a lot of choice here. So today I'm going to be playing Chopin. I was thinking uh, last night about an experience that I had. Uh, I was a student uh, for several years at, at the University of Vienna, and I also uh, would drop in at the uh, Conservatory of Vienna. And as a student there. I led a kind of life that, that if you've ever seen uh, Puccini's opera La Boheme, that's kind of the life I led. I mean, it was, it was wonderful. I was incredibly poor. Uh, I, I literally would hang out in front of uh, coffee shops and bakeries just to smell the food that I couldn't afford. <laughs> uh, and I had a rowdy group of friends that uh, uh, traversed the city of Vienna with me many, many times. And I met some really fantastic and interesting people. And, one of my favorite people that I met in Vienna, his name was Franz. Franz was actually not from Vienna. He was uh, from uh, just across uh, the border in Bratislava. And the first time I uh, met him, I was at the conservatory, and I was walking down the hallways of uh, the, the innumerable piano practice rooms, and I heard someone practicing, and it was so striking to me. I never heard such incredible scales. I mean, he was just playing scales. And they were beautiful. And uh, uh, later on then, during a break, I saw him standing outside his practice room. And I went up and I started talking to him. And, and uh, of course, uh, you, you know, his, his, his English was uh, not very good. So this was, we would always talk in German. But he had a very heavy uh, Czech accent. And one of the things that was striking about him, not only his playing, but he had such a powerful way of playing. And he was himself, though, very small, and he didn't look well to me even then. Um, and uh, so he was a, an interesting combination of a person, you know, and we've all met these people. They had incredible persona, incredible power, uh, but Franz was, was clearly uh, suffering. Um, later on, uh, in this little group of friends, as, as we traveled through the city, Franz would sometimes show up, and he had a girlfriend. Her name was Aurora, and Aurora was an Austrian, and she came from a very, very well-to-do family, and she was a poet and a writer, and a pretty accomplished one, evidently. Uh, and so this unlikely pair uh, became something of celebrities in a way, because she was so famous, occasionally I would even see her in the boulevard side tunes or the, you know, the, the local papers, and I, would see, and I would see Franz sometimes in the background mentioned. Uh, and so he was a a kind of a distant friend to me, uh, but I kept track of his career. He was, over the two years I was at the university, he kept rising in fame, and he played several times with some of the major orchestras. Not very often, but when he played, it was quite an event. And I would see the reviews in the paper, and I would congratulate him. And uh, I think the high point came, uh, I was at the Vienna Opera Ball. Uh, and if you've ever watched uh, uh, any of the programs about Vienna and the New Year, sometimes you'll see some of the shots of the great uh, um, Vienna Opera House where the opera ball is held. And there's nothing quite like it in the world. I mean, I was dazzled by the incredible beauty of the hall and, and you know, for the waltzes and the various dances, you have the Vienna Philharmonic playing. I mean, who's not going to love that? Uh, and then all around you in the loges are all the rich and powerful from the entire European continent and beyond. Uh, just a glittering moment. And then as you walk through the opera house, on each of the floors there are different rooms that are filled with various types of gambling, various types of musical performances throughout the evening, and it lasts until you know, four or five in the morning. So it was just a huge extravaganza, and I was so grateful to be there. And I walked into one of these salons at one point, and, and there was Franz, and he was playing. And there was a group of people around him, and they had dimmed the lights down, and he was performing this incredible work. Uh, it was really hypnotizing, and and they had turned the lights down to where it was almost impossible to see. It was really, really dark, because evidently that's the way Franz liked it. So it was like really dark. 
and he was playing this piece, and people were, were just mesmerized, and, and uh, uh, you know, I could see Aurora sitting there uh, listening to him, so powerful. And uh, when it was over, um, I went up to him and I said, you know, Franz, uh, your, your playing is, has taken on an even deeper quality and, and it's so powerful. And I said, where does this come from? Where does this come from? And he said, well, Don, uh, you probably don't know this, but uh, I'm terminally ill. I'm going to die. And I was amazed by this, right? Because I, he, he didn't look well, but he was very conscious of the fact that his time was limited. And he said, when I play, that's my opportunity to be alive. That's my opportunity to express myself. Uh, but I play with the knowledge that my days are numbered. Now, you probably figured out that there really was no fronts. But I'm actually talking about Chopin. Right? And the title of this lecture is, Who Was Chopin? That's who he was. He would have been just like that if I had a chance to meet him. And so when I play, I think of that person who knew from the time he was probably 10 or 12 because he had tuberculosis, that his days were numbered. And he talked frequently and openly about that. That permeates his music. And it gives it its beauty, its beauty, right? Because it's transient. All beautiful things are transient. But fortunately, he wrote his music down. And I can recreate it. And that's what I'm going to do. Today I'm going to play, uh, I'm going to start with two preludes. He wrote most of the preludes while he was on an island called Majorca. And he'd gone there for his health. He was suffering from tuberculosis. The doctor said, well, maybe if you go to this southern island in the Mediterranean, you'll get better. Uh, but when he got there, it turned out the climate was terrible. <laughs> and uh, the, the townspeople found out that he had tuberculosis, so he forced, they forced him and his lover, Aurore Dudevant, who was also known as Georges Sand, a famous writer. They forced them to live outside of the city in an old monastery that didn't even have glass on the windows. And they had, for heat, they had a little charcoal stove. You can imagine what that was like for someone with tuberculosis. So what did he do? He wrote some of the most beautiful pieces ever. Uh, and I'm going to play two of them. I'm going to play the famous preludes in C minor and then prelude in E minor.
George Sand, a roaring du devant, uh, Chopin's lover at one time, um, how Chopin was doing. And uh, she said, Chopin has composed two preludes that are worth more than 40 novels and express more than all the literature of the last century. I don't know if she meant those two, but wouldn't it be great to have a fan like Aurora? <laughs> I mean, she loved it. And when she talked about his music, you could tell the incredible passion uh, that was there. Um, the next two pieces I'm going to play are called Nocturnes. And you'll remember in the story I was telling you about Franz uh, and his life, I mentioned to you the idea of walking into a room where Chopin would have been playing that was almost dark, uh, where people perhaps had just come back from a great performance uh, of the opera or the symphony, and they were relaxing, and they would have gathered around uh, the piano in a really elegant salon in Paris, and Chopin would have been there uh, as the star attraction, because every aristocrat in Paris wanted to have that special attraction in their palace to perform, and Chopin obliged them. And that was really the audience that he preferred he played only a handful of public concerts. He would have been mortified to play it here today. <laughs> this would not have been his metier at all, right? He liked to play for small, private groups. And when he did have to play in public, it drove him nuts. Um, but the idea of uh, the aesthetic of the time is an aesthetic which is built upon the opera. It's built upon the beautiful song. Chopin lived during an era called bel canto, the beautiful voice great composers like Donizetti and Bellini, and then later Verdi, where you have this beautiful, heavenly voice singing over a, a lush accompaniment. And you're just haunted by that one very simple but beautiful melody, so beautiful that you just can't get it out of your head. And Chopin would go to the opera, and in fact, he was a very good friend of Bellini, one of the great composers in this style. And so he became, in a sense, the kind of uh, Bellini for piano. In other words, his music has those incredible melodies, some of which are just completely unforgettable. And I'm going to play two, again, two of the most famous today. I'm going to play a, a, a nocturne in E flat, and then I'm going to play one in, in F minor. Um, now, the nocturne, even the title of the piece, is very unusual because it means something that's done in the evening, something at night. It's intended to be kind of nebulous. There's not any real set form for a nocturne. Uh, each one of them is really individual and different, but each one is very evocative and recreates that special world where Chopin's music really flourishes.
man was a composer who was born in Poland. His father was French, his mother was Polish. So he grew up in a bilingual family. His father had taught French at many of the aristocratic courts, particularly in Warsaw. So Chopin grew up in a really cultured environment, but not a wealthy environment. He brought with him the literature, the spirit, the, the kind of sense of person that was very, very Polish, and he was very proud of that. So he spoke throughout his life, and people would comment, comment on this even when he lived in Paris for so long, that he still spoke with a very heavy Polish accent. And he always insisted if he had a servant that they'd be from Poland. <laughs> so he had this special affection and love for Poland, but he also had mem many memories associated with it. And if, you, if you're like me, whenever you've traveled, if you, even if you've traveled perhaps not so just in the place of Vienna, but wherever you've been, if you've been by yourself, sometimes that really heightens the experience. You begin to understand better who you are. For me, my years in Europe really focused my attention on who I was as an American. Uh, I realized that I was different. I realized that I had a different point of view. And I really missed and longed for many of those things that I characteristically think of as American. And I'm sure for Chopin, there was a real strong sense of nostalgia and longing for Poland. And at the time, the politicians in Poland were, were very brutal. There had been an, an invasion of the Russians, and the country was partitioned. A lot of the dreams that they had for their own sovereign national state were evaporating. And this was very troubling to Chopin. In fact, one of the, the worst incidents occurred when he was a student himself in Vienna. Uh, he had come to Vienna to study and also to perform. And during that time, this is the time when he was between 19 and 22, right in through there, uh, he composed a couple of very famous pieces. One of them, maybe the most famous large piece by Chopin, the Ballade in G minor. This is a piece that was composed in Vienna during that period of time, but then revised later when he was more mature. So it combines kind of the early Chopin with the more mature Chopin. Uh, and it's called a ballade. Uh, at the time, people were mystified by this because a ballade is supposed to be a poem or a story. It's not supposed to be a piece of music. And certainly, it's a piece of music that does seem to tell a story, but we'll never know what the story was for Chopin. But all of you can have a story. So as you listen to this piece, you may be creating your own story in your mind, your own special way of connecting with the piece of art. Because it doesn't necessarily have to be the same story that the artist has in mind for it to be really powerful. In fact, how you transform it yourself in many ways is even more powerful. The Ballade in G minor is a piece that uh, has many different sections. Uh, it really is a kind of universe of Chopin's approach to the piano and to the keyboard. And so as you listen to this, you'll hear lots and lots of different approaches, uh, many of which were highly original. Chopin didn't just write piano music, but he really created the, the modern piano. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote his music for the very early versions of the piano, and many of the great piano makers in Paris at the time, upon hearing Chopin's playing, said, we have to improve our instrument. It can't keep up with him. We have to make it more powerful. We have to give it uh, a, a wider tone. We have to make the softer softer and the louder louder. His music demands that you play on an instrument that has all of those capabilities. And as a good pianist, you learn early on that you can never choose your instrument. So you have to be prepared to play whatever instrument you have. Our humble instrument is, is not the greatest, but it has moments. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to try to, to bring out of it whatever I possibly can. But the, the real thing here is that um, Chopin's revolutionary technique and approach to the instrument focused on learning, on, on creating a style of playing that was idiomatic, that was suited particularly for the piano. If you can imagine, when Chopin was growing up, the harpsichord was still very popular. Uh, and so the piano was just in its infancy as he was a child, and then as he grew into manhood, the piano kind of became the lead instrument. And his music was so popular throughout Europe that it was one of the primary motivators for people to want to own pianos and to be able to play these pieces. Uh, 
I have a strange connection uh, with Chopin in that, uh, you know, musicians love to talk about, you know, their, their connections and uh, with the past. And my piano teacher, my primary teacher, uh, uh, who I, I studied with for many years in Texas before I went to Eastman, his name was Russell Reapy, uh, was himself a student of Solima Stravinsky, who was the son of Igor Stravinsky. And Solima Stravinsky was the son of Isidore Philip, who was a great pianist in Paris at the turn of the century. And he was, in turn, a student of Georges Matthias, who was the, the most uh, distinguished student of Chopin. So, four times removed, I have studied with Chopin. <laughs> And my teacher, you know, would specifically talk about Chopin in very special tones uh, because, you know, that was, a, that was a different approach than one would be taking with many other pieces. And frankly, as a young man, I found it overwhelming. I, I almost uh, shied away from playing Chopin. I found it just overwhelming uh, on many levels, emotionally and technically. Now, of course, I, I feel much closer to it, but it's been a process for me as well. And this piece, in a way, is um, a work that really epitomizes all that's great about Chopin. I certainly hope you enjoy it uh, as much as I enjoy playing it, the Ballade in G minor. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. <laughs> that takes you to a lot of different places, that piece, doesn't it? And it's one of the most famous. Um, I have a lot of favorite performers. Uh, there's a great Czech pianist, uh, Ivan Moravitz, who I listened to even growing up as an incredible performer. Sviatoslav Richter has a great recording of this. Horowitz, of course, his recording is really quite dynamic and beautiful. Um, but for me, playing this piece personally is something that is transformational for me. It's something that pushes me to improve and be a better pianist, to bring more to my music and to my art, to bring something of myself to these works, even though they were written by Chopin. For me, it's a part, it's an extension of myself. And I think that that's the definition of great art, is that great art is something that you can connect with and that transforms you and hopefully transforms you for the better. And I think that's true with all of our endeavors here at the college. If you're just teaching in a classroom, giving that really great lecture, working really hard on that moment where you can bring that to your students and see them transformed, that is a performance. That's just as much of a performance as playing the Chopin a lot. And the faculty here do it every day and many times a week. That's one of the reasons that they're exhausted in April. <laughs> and I'm so pleased to see so many of them here today to be with us, because I know that it took a special effort. But that sense of using art to transform us for the better is something that's so critical to use whatever we do to transform us for the better. When I first was being interviewed here, uh, Sister Helen Carney, who was on the search committee, uh, I, I was saying to them, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be interviewed, you know, uh, um, I have a strong connection with Catholic education. I was with the Jesuits. I taught at Jesuit universities for 15 years. And she said, we're not going to hold that against you. <laughs> but she would agree with me when I say this, that one of the things that St. Ignatius taught was to find God in all things. So whatever it is that you do, professor, student, staff, person, visitor today, to find God in all things, especially something as beautiful as Chopin, that's really why we're here. So I thank all of you for being here today. I'm so happy to see so many of you. I know you took time out of your, your busy schedule. As they say in the airlines, we know that you have many other options, uh, <laughs> but, but you chose this particular common hour. So I'm, I'm really, really happy to have done that and so proud of the work that all of you were doing and, and the terrific success that St. Joseph's is having. I think that um, for me, being able to share something of myself is important too because it helps you understand that I too am a person. Uh, I actually can do stuff. And uh, in fact, I remember in Scranton one time, I heard two faculty talking in the bathroom about me. I was in the bathroom. And uh, they said, uh, he says, yeah, yeah, Boone Garden, uh, He's the first provost we've had that could actually do anything. <laughs> I think they were referring to my piano playing. Uh, in any case, thank you so much for coming out today, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.